Welcome to the first talk of the spring 22 season for um, the MFA Fine Arts talk series here at the School of Visual Arts. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Ramos, a Brooklyn-based new media artist who describes his work as, quote, fragile post-colonial technology. He uses the web, software, physical computing, digital sculpture, and digital fabrication to, in his words, quote, facilitate encounters with our own uncertain digital futures. Mark is deeply committed to the ideas and practices of open source technology and culture, the free sharing of code, art and information, collaboration, and, um, and uh, the sort of spirit of, of, of sharing what you make with others so that they can um, continue the project uh, in a collaborative way. Um, especially when it uh, comes to creative technology. Mark has exhibited his work and lectured widely, both online and AFK, or away from keyboard. Um, Pache, um, uh, uh, Glitch Feminism by Legacy Ruffles, um, including as part of Rhizome's first look program at the New Museum of Contemporary Art, um, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, the Times Museum in Beijing, the Sichuan Biennale, Arbeit Gallery in London, and at the Peter Weibel Institute for Digital Culture in Vienna. Mark teaches art after the internet in the MFA Arts Department, our department here at SVA, uh, form and code at Pratt, as well as web programming and computer principles in the computer science department at NYU. Mark received a BA from Hampshire College, and an MFA in computer art from SVA. Please join me in welcoming Mark Ramos. Hey everyone. It's nice to uh, see all of you again. I feel like I just saw you a few weeks ago. I time plays tricks on you online. Um, but it's uh, an honor to be invited as the uh, first speaker for talks. Uh, so thanks very much for uh, listening to me prattle on online yet again. I'm gonna uh, start up my screen share. Um, so like Mike, uh, Mark said, uh, my name is Mark Ramos. I'm a new media artist and I work with things like web and software programming, digital sculpture and animation and physical computing to make fragile post-colonial technology. Uh, by fragile, I mean it doesn't always work all the time, and I'll get to post-colonial in a minute. Um, I'm really committed to the ideas of open source and making hopefully funny and ironic websites that are sometimes critical of oppression and corporate and governmental control on the web. One of the ideas that's really been informing my work lately is Benjamin Bratton's ideas of the stacks. Mark might know Benjamin because he is a professor at UCSD now. I don't know if he was when you were there. Um, but this idea of the stacks has two core arguments. Planetary scale computation uh, distorts and deforms traditional Westphalian logics of political geography and creates new territories in its own image and that different scales of computing technology can be understood as forming an accidental megastructure that resembles a multi-layer network architecture stack. Um, so this kind of diagram of the stack is a way uh, to sort of understand uh, kind of the forces that sort of govern our lives um, on this like planetary wide level. Um, my collaborator and I, Xiang Wu, are actually making this uh, into a platform game uh, for this that's being funded by this Chinese company called CryptoSea for an uh, exhibition in Beijing. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is exploring uh, ideas of the blockchain and the environment through this uh, kind of platform game that we're making out of the stacks. Uh, but the stack is described as a platform um, that represents a technological and institutional model equivalent to states or markets, but reducible to neither. During the beginning of uh, my kind of work from home period, I made this AR filter that transformed the city into one ruled by giant corporations. I made this partly in response to the small businesses I saw closing in my neighborhood. 
I use Instagram's native Spark AR app along with the 3D assets I made in Blender because I wanted it to be accessible to anyone on social media. I changed the corporate names to parodies because I thought it was funny, but the filter was eventually banned from Instagram for containing adult beings. Uh, these sort of banned pieces that I'm about to talk about are all showing at Microscope Gallery in Bushwick in February. So we're doing a bunch of custom browser embedding. But I will kind of, so I ended up calling this filter first world problems. And it kind of creates this cityscape uh, where all the corporations kind of have these parodied um, sort of ad names like FedEx is fed up. Amazon is anxiety, YouTube is no to, et cetera. Um, and so I wanted to kind of release this uh, using Instagram's native uh, Spark AR app, uh, except I couldn't get it approved. Since I was spending so much time online, I wanted to explore how web developers use a psychology of addiction to make transactional our interactions on the web. Developers reward us with things like bright colors, slick graphics, and messages that make us feel good about ourselves in order to keep us engaged on their platforms. Uh, so I made this Google Chrome extension that I wrote with Node.js that changed all images on the web to social media likes and video game win graphics in the hopes of making my everyday internet browsing experience more gratifying. I wanted to upload it to Chrome's public extensions, uh, but it was banned by Chrome. I have, uh, so the gallery that I'm working with, we're doing a bunch of like custom web embedding to make these pieces sort of interactable and viewable, but I have all of this kind of video documentation that I'll share. So you kind of download this extension off Chrome. When you have it activate, activated, it changes all of the images on your website to social media likes and video game win graphics in the hopes of making your browsing experience more gratifying. I think I originally had this footage for like a presentation I was doing at New Link. So that's why there's a bunch of New Link stuff. You got the idea. This kind of last piece in this band series is uh, was banned on Twitter. And uh, oops. This one was actually commissioned by the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. Um, they wanted me to make a piece that confronted the institution's history of displacing residents of, once, of what once was a neighborhood of new immigrants and the birthplace of SF's leather community. So if you've never kind of spent time in San Francisco, um, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts is this sort of big arts museum complex that's located in this area called Soma or South of Market. Um, and that area has kind of been in the news recently for a bunch of reasons, uh, primarily in the all throughout the 2000s for being this kind of site of hyper gentrification that all of the new tech workers that were kind of moving to San Francisco were moving into this neighborhood of Soma. Um, but before even that, um, that neighborhood was sort of like the cradle of SF's leather queer community, like a lot of the gay leather bars, um, etc, were kind of located in that area. Um, and it also was kind of home to uh, these sort of residential hotels that were primarily uh, sort of populated by new immigrants. And all of that was sort of raised because the city found um, those communities kind of undesirable. So they sort of destroyed all of those structures to create the museum that this piece is now showing in. 
Um, so for them, I made this series of AI chatbots trained on, a ver on various historic data sets, like old drummer magazine porn, um, with the intention of setting them loose on Twitter. So I used uh, this Python library called GPT2Simple to train the AIs. And the intention was that users could converse with the bots um, and through this trained dialogue, confront these specific kinds of historic memory. Uh, the bots were banned on Twitter, but the museum did a physical installation of the work on multiple screens, as well as made the URLs available to visitors to chat with the bots live. So I've got some footage of that. It's kind of dirty, so avert your eyes if you are sensitive to that. So I think the one that I'm going to demo, um, there were four bots, but the one that I'm going to demo is called Leatherbot. And I used uh, the, these old magazines called Drummer, which was this national leather kind of queer publication in the early 70s, um, when things like that were still very much sort of suspect. And I scanned all of those in and made them machine readable and used them uh, to create this AI training data set that I implemented with GPT-2 Simple. So ideally, the bot is supposed to kind of like talk like a lot of the literature that's present in these sources. Um, it's very dominant and sexually explicit. So when the museum showed this, because they were banned on Twitter, they did like a kind of multiplexed installation of the different bots all on different screens in the lobby. And then they had these QR codes uh, throughout the museum so people could um, find the bots live on the web. So all of the things that it's saying, like the AI is sort of generating um, from uh, these data sets. So I spent a lot of time kind of scanning in these 70s leather porn magazines to make this data set. Speaking of surveillance on the web, that was my great segue, sorry. Um, interesting fact I learned while working from home uh, is that uh, medical marijuana or marijuana grown for legal sale and use must spend its entire existence um, its entire life from growth harvest to transport and sale documented on camera and online. Its eventual use is also documented online, right? Because people post, um, you know, pictures of what they do after they've smoked it. So what if we applied the same level of transparency to how technology manifests around the world in different places? Yes, I'm aware that tech goes through checkpoints at various stages of development, but we're still primarily focused on the user end. We don't necessarily talk about network, network culture in the same breath that we talk about the support technological networks require with labor, production, customer service call centers and manufacturing, as well as cleaning and disposal, and of course, luxury vacations for stressed out tech workers. So what if we saw all of that in addition to the user end? So these kinds of ideas um, were what I was working on for the past couple of years. I've also been like making work with this hashtag called tropical futurism. Uh, it's a hashtag I used to describe new media artworks and community-based programming focused on the place of the developing world and our collective visioning of the future. Um, so I describe it as work that's informed by imperial colonial past, current global service industry economies, and a future of rising sea levels that threaten to drown tropical island nations. I'm just going to read this quote. To reword a great Dylan Morgan gag, while we were talking, Google very, very gradually built a feature around us. Please replace Google with whatever or whomever you like to satisfy your own biases. The point stands that the entities constructing and steering our futures, what they often like to call the future, with all the baggage of powerlessness and inevitability that that wording brings, aren't states. And they work on a completely different geopolitical strategy, a strata. There is no town square for Google. Um, so a lot of the work that I'm about to kind of introduce and talk about um, 
kind of uses this hashtag tropical futurism and looks at this sort of expanded view of technology. Um, so I've been making loaders lately as a way to think about things we wait for on the internet or the empty promises of technology in the future. Um, these are, I kind of made a series of these and these are showing on New Art City as part of the show called Where is the Cyberpunk We Were Promised um, in March. Uh, so I just kind of use simple JavaScript to make a bunch of these. Sorry, I'm like organizing a bunch of windows that I have up. Uh, the first piece that I'm going to demo is called Best Cop Tropicalia. Um, uh, this iteration is hosted online with Airbyte Gallery. Um, and uh, it's a tropical island getaway on the internet. Desktop Tropicalia highlights the dichotomy and contradictions of developing tropical island nations and the rapid implementation of technological and network systems. Um, so I wanted to kind of create this online space that all of these kinds of contradictory notions of the future were like juxtaposed with tropical imagery. Oh, here, I'll put this link in the chat too. It'll, uh, it may make your computer run slow, but remember it's uh, this gallery's code and not mine. Uh, so I kind of created this online space that was sort of modeled after uh, the kind of desktop wallpaper people have on their computers, like uh, tropical island getaways, et cetera. Um, and I just kind of wanted to make uh, some of these ideas very literal, like the server farm is an actual farm with like a carabao pulling it. Um, the kind of cube that's rotating at the bottom in the ocean is uh, this town in the Philippines that was drowned through global warming. Um, and the one thing that people never get about this piece is that if you click on the ocean, this dolphin will jump out for like whatever reason, people never click on the ocean, but you can kind of click on everything else. Like if you click on the birds, they sort of move around and you click on the trees or grow, et cetera. So this, this piece actually ended up showing a bunch. I also uh, kind of made this CAPTCHA project uh, that I kind of talked about a little bit earlier. Um, it's this interactive web application that I ended up using AngularJS and PHP to make. Uh, Google does provide um, most of like the capture technology, like those libraries are provided by Google, uh, but because of my own political views and a concern for surveillance capitalism, um, I decided to just kind of reverse engineer the whole capture software. Um, so I kind of uh, recreated this capture software uh, for those of you that may or may not be aware, uh, CAPTCHA is an acronym for a completely automated public Turing test. Um, and I'm sure you've encountered these on the web, uh, but they're based on the ideas of uh, this kind of computer scientist named Alan Turing that we actually talk a lot about in my art after the internet class. Um, and it's a challenge response based test used in computing to determine whether or not the user is human. Um, so in this piece, the AI selects from a pool of post-colonial imagery sourced from the internet the added challenge to this test for humanity is the viewer's reaction to images of the developing world. I'm also uh, making this, um, so with IPP NYU, one of the projects that I'm doing there is making a programming library that allows users to program using the Bai Bayin um, alphabet. So Bai Bayin is a pre-Hispanic Philippine script or writing system. Uh, the widespread use of this language ended with Spanish colonialism in the Philippines, uh, but this project attempts to reframe the, the act and practice of writing code as not just participation in technological culture, but also the retention and reconfiguration of pre-colonial history and knowledge systems. Um, so partly why this is also interesting to me is that um, as many people know, English is the basis for all modern programming languages. You basically can't be a programmer unless you have some English fluency. Uh, there, uh, there aren't programming languages in other um, languages other than English. 
Um, so as a result, program English language fluency and programming language fluency is one of the fastest growing kinds of language acquisition in the developing world, uh, because people um, trying to make a living uh, are um, kind of becoming programmers and learning English as a result. So often computer programming is seen as instrumental to post-colonial countries participation in modern capitalist network economies. This project attempts to make the act of coding programming part of retention and reconfiguration of pre-colonial culture. Um, so this is kind of a project that I'm working on specifically with ITP at NYU. And the great thing about this project is it's not wholly an original idea. Um, these kinds of sort of niche computing languages or art computing languages are referred to as ESOLANGs or esoteric programming languages. And there's kind of been a lot of work in this area. There are esoteric programming languages developed using like the Sioux writing system, um, Yoruba and Swahili, as well as Arabic. Um, so there's like a whole community of people kind of making this kind of work. This is an older piece called Jeepney Drones. Um, I wanted to fuse tropical imagery with the visual language of the future in really obvious ways. Um, so I 3D printed Jeepney forms and decorated them with vinyl prints I made using real Jeepney decorations found on the web. This, uh, what I kind of find funny about this piece in the context of this audience is this entire thing was made at the BFL. Um, so a Jeepney is a form of public transportation in the Philippines. Originally, they were made from old World War II Jeeps and they become somewhat synonymous for the overcrowded, polluted, poverty afflicted and unsafe conditions in Metro Manila. I'm interested in the place of developing countries within a global culture that increasingly prioritizes rapid innovation and consumerism. There's some more shots and there's more documentation on my website. Let me just pull up. So I ended up only making two, uh, but kind of what I really wanted to get more into was using uh, kind of like corporate fabrication or production as an artist process. And I eventually wanted to get it that I could just kind of produce hundreds of these and sell them like souvenirs that you might find at an airport. Um, and shows with them would end up being uh, like people uh, kind of all flying their own drone. Uh, but what I showed them was at the show at Columbia, um, at Columbia University in this big group show and then kind of did fly. Uh, this next piece is called Sorry. Uh, this next piece is called Fantasy Island. It's a Wi-Fi enabled sculpture of the tropical island emoji. Uh, this documentation is from an installation on Governor's Island as part of the Nada Art Fair. Uh, I'll show some video documentation of it. Yeah. Now, So I call it a Wi-Fi enabled sculpture because the piece itself is like a Wi-Fi portal. Um, there's like two Raspberry Pis uh, inside that broadcast the Wi-Fi network um, and people can join the sculpture with their phone. Um, and then when they do, it starts pushing archived Firefest tweets to their phone. I wanted uh, people to be able to relive the highs and lows of Firefest uh, through the archived tweets. And then like the miniature screens are showing a video documentation of tropical vacations people have posted online. So this piece was also made at the VFL. Uh, I uh, vacuum formed kind of the base and then 3D printed out that palm tree. This last kind of piece you can actually launch on your phone. 
Um, I, it's called reforestation. And if you point your phone camera at the QR code on the screen, it should open up a web page that you can plant 3D palm trees by tapping your screen. Um, I've got some video in case you don't want to do that. Uh, I call this piece reforestation. It uses AR. I was using like a very early p5.js AR library to make this. Um, uh, and then what it's doing is it's sourcing from these 3D palm tree models people uploaded to the Google Poly database. I'll show some video of that. So you can kind of like through touch plant these like uh, 3D uh, tree models that people uh, uploaded to Google Poly. And like part of my artist statement was that uh, these virtual forests may end up being the only forests that remain. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about collaboration, recent drops, and works in progress. Uh, so one of the things that I'm working on for a show later this summer is I'm making a phone farm uh, using phones made by overseas labor that perpetually mine for Bitcoin. Um, uh, the mined e-currency is made, made available to the uh, people that fabricated these phones. So I'm like sourcing a bunch of these phones that were made uh, in factories overseas, reprogramming them uh, so that they fa uh, farm for cryptocurrency, um, and then kind of setting up this gallery space uh, so that it's optimized uh, for this kind of server installation. There's just another shot of that. So I have this collaborator that I work with a lot who's currently uh, located in Beijing. Uh, his name is Yang Wu. He actually also used to teach at SBA. Um, but we worked on this project together called Network Ecosystem. Um, and I'll give you the link to this. So we were kind of doing this fellowship with uh, Nokia Bell Labs. And so we were collaborating uh, with their robotics engineers. And what we ended up making um, is this piece called uh, Network Ecosystem, uh, where we took uh, the data from their experimental robotics and AI, and we used that uh, to drive this online simulation. Um, Rhizome made this entire site. But what I think is funny is that when you kind of go view the work, they're using like my original em embed of this work on itch. For some reason, I find that amazing. Uh, but you can kind of like run it through itch. We used Unity. Uh, so the way that Xiang and I's collaboration works a lot is Xiang does like the 3D graphics and then I'll do like the programming part. Uh, so I did, we did all of this programming using C Sharp, which is like Unity's um, kind of main language. And so you sort of enter in this space where all this data is like presented to you in this very conventional way. You can like interact with those screens. And then if you sort of walk outside, this entire environment is basically being driven uh, by that digital data. Um, so things like the day night cycle are being driven by the temperature data that we're collecting from Bell Labs. Um, the humidity is driving the rain, uh, the gas density is driving uh, the fog, and you can kind of walk through this environment uh, that's sort of completely, um, this ecosystem that's completely uh, kind of being driven by digital data. These little like firefly things uh, respond to the Wi-Fi signal strength at Bell Labs. And then there's kind of like this waterfall um, sort of area. What we had started doing with this project is we wanted 
like the characters uh, to kind of function as organisms. So like those little like flying robots at the top, um, they breed according to like the light levels. So they breed according to like the Wi-Fi signal strength. And if there's more of them, then they start to breed. And if there's less, then they sort of die. Um, this project showed a bunch in China and I'll talk a little bit about the derivations. Uh, so while Ziyang was in China, um, he did a bunch of kind of like remixes of this work. Uh, so let me kind of go to this. Uh, we were um, partnering with the engineers at Alibaba to create like a mixed reality version of this. Um, so they ended up kind of showing it at the show that they sponsored called Exuberance is Beauty. Um, so what they did with it is that they had these uh, sort of proprietary, I don't know if you can see them in this pic, but if anyone's interested, I have more documentation, but they have these proprietary um, sort of gog mixed reality goggles. Here's a video of it. So we work with them to port our entire piece um, for display in these kinds of, in this uh, sort of mixed reality toggle that they have. So I had heard um, that there's this kind of like competition to see which company is going to become first on the metaverse, right? So like this sort of immersive kind of ways to interact with online environments or sort of like the basis of the metaverse. Um, so there's a little bit of like a corporate arms race to see who gets there first. Um, so it was funny that we had like come from this fellowship with Nokia Bell Labs and then we're working with Alibaba because they were like direct competitors. And then the other kind of way that this showed um, was we made this kind of interactive like physical install. So this install of it is actually going um, to show in Seoul, South Korea um, over the summer too. Um, the name of the institution escapes me, unfortunately. Um, but what I found funny about this kind of remix of it is it ended up being like uh, really popular on social media. Like there was a bunch of like selfies on WeChat and Weibo of people sort of interacting with this uh, installation. Uh, so the last kind of thing that I'm going to talk about is this collaboration uh, that I did with my cohort at New Inc. Um, so we produced an uh, online exhibition for New Art City um, that uh, with contributions by Lindsay Howard, uh, who works for Foundation, which is that big NFT company, and then Zach Kaplan, who's the director of Rhizome. Um, and we created these kind of online art metaverse platforms. Um, so. Let me actually get to that. And I'll give you the link in the chat too. Uh, so we ended up creating, uh, we called our show NFS NSFW NFT. The name started off as a joke on a Slack thread. Uh, so uh, they are called NFS, not for sale, NSFW, not safe for work, and NFT, non-fungible token. 
Um, so all of the work is kind of curated under uh, those acronyms. Um, so the first place, let me turn the sound off on my end, but feel free on yours. But you kind of enter this sort of like home gallery and we really wanted to resist kind of the idea of the white cube in an online exhibition space. So we kind of designed our spaces to look like landscapes. Um, and they're like skinned with artifacts of our online collaboration. So the mountains are like our uh, Slack thread, uh, our Slack threads, uh, the ocean is our like email conversations and all the ways that we uh, were collaborating online when we couldn't kind of meet up in person. And then the essays by Lindsay and Zach um, are also embedded in this room. Uh, so please like have a read. Uh, some of those essays are like really great. Like Lindsay really talks about sort of the utopic promise of web 3.0. I have my own feelings about that. Um, uh, but she talks about kind of like the co-created web and uh, web 3.0 and sort of decentralizing the internet. And then Zach uh, sort of talks about his essay is called um, Another New World. So you kind of start off in this like kind of home gallery um, and then you can uh, travel to the other galleries through these portals. Uh, so the first one we can visit together. If you're following me online, you can do this with me or you can uh, kind of just watch my screen. Uh, but this first gallery is called Not For Sale. Um, so this gallery kind of hosts work uh, with artists that were really critical about kind of the hyper commodification that happens in the NFT or blockchain space. Um, so Ricardo Miranda Zuniga is in it, I'm in it, Bhavik Singh and Johanna Flato. Uh, so this world is kind of reskinned with cryptocurrency. My computer's taking a little while to load. So like the mountains are Bitcoin, uh, the water is our Ethereum tokens. And then there's like Monero tokens for the flowers. And Ricardo has this piece, this video piece in it. Bavik is growing these like algorithm, algorithmic plants in this landscape. And then I have this piece kind of here on the right that I sort of later showed kind of in a more solo context with Radiator Gallery. Um, but we can visit another gallery. Mark, I think I'm, we're still seeing the home screen on the screen share. Sorry, thanks. I, I only just noticed because I was doing it on, on my own, but I'd be good to, I'd love to, to follow your guided tour. Thanks. So uh, again, this gallery that's hopefully on the screen right now is called NFS, um, not for sale. And the work in here um, is kind of super critical about the hyper-capitalization that kind of happens in the blockchain and with NFTs. Uh, but the other gallery that this links to is called NSFW or Not Safe for Work. And the artists in this gallery um, are kind of exploring like how sexuality is uh, sort of uh, commercialized on the web. Um, are you seeing this loading screen by the way? Yeah. So this, this one actually comes with like a content warning because a lot of the artists are working with like sexually explicit themes. Uh, but the cubes on the top are from this artist, Nahi Kim. Um, it's called The Shapes of Sex. And she used, uh, she basically fed a bunch of like porn videos to an AI um, and let it generate images from those videos. And it kind of came up with uh, these sort of odd shapes and uh, kind of intertwined characters because it like didn't understand that level of human intimacy. Uh, we're also showing Perlin Lee's work. Um, and she has this piece called Real Girlfriend. It's kind of this performance-based AR work. Um, it's conceived in AR and she kind of role plays as these sort of like avatar tropes, like she kind of cosplays as these sort of like avatar 
uh, feminist tropes. Um, she's actually sold a bunch of these uh, through foundation as NFTs. Um, Perlin's really big in the NFT space. And then if you kind of like go down in this mountain, You'll see this work by uh, Christopher Clary. Um, and he has this show called The Chrissy Show uh, that kind of, uh, it's on Chatterbait. Um, so we created, we kind of hit it, uh, but he kind of like live streams through this space. Oh, I know, I know. Y'all are just gonna change this. This is like archive footage. Because it's like slutty slow music. And then, and then the last piece in here, uh, is this video by Itziar Barrio called Robota MML. Um, and she kind of is looking at like sexuality and AI. And then the last space uh, is called NFT. And this has work by Yesul Song, Ziyang Wu, and Lula Mabratu. Um, so the work in this gallery kind of fully embraces the idea of NFT and artists um, and the kind of empowering uh, sort of um, parts of that that happen for artists. So the first piece that you see is called Dalston uh, by this British based artist called Lula XYZ. I think she would also call herself like a sound artist or a musician, uh, but she basically makes uh, those like, those hand movements that she's, she's doing uh, trigger the instrumentals and the sound. She works uh, with like wearable technology um, and she kind of made those gloves. And then up here is this piece by Yesel Song called Bot Sculpture. Um, and this piece is like fairly contemplative. Like if you walk into it, you hear her kind of describing a sculpture and she asks you to draw it and kind of upload the file. And then this piece in the middle is called A Woman with Technology by Ziyang Wu. Um, and it's kind of an older piece of his, uh, but he used an AI uh, to kind of generate a script that he later 3D animated. Um, this, this piece has also seen a lot of success kind of on NFT platforms. I think that's it. I've gone on uh, for about an hour. So I'm gonna stop my share, but I'm happy uh, to kind of take any questions or comments from people in the audience. Thanks, Mark. Have you ever known of like any white hat hackers that are doing art as well? I don't know if they would necessarily describe themselves as like white hat hackers, but I think that there's definitely a community of people uh, that are really good at programming and like hold hacker values. Uh, that make work. Um, the School for Poetic Computation is like a great place to find. Uh, a lot of them teach there. Let me uh, put the link in the chat. But this is kind of like this artist run school that a lot of people that I've worked with uh, have sort of done residencies at. Um, is there like a cool. specific reason you asked though? Um, well, I've been like, I've been just watching like a bunch of videos about hacking and famous hackers and, you know, and just uh, hearing their stories, how they just started as young, as young kids looking at computer manuals and just dissecting all these things. And then at 16 years old, they took down multiple networks. And I'm just thinking like, I wonder like if uh, somebody with this type of mind, like what kind of work they would make if they were artists. And then I was like, maybe there is so. I don't know. And yeah, the whole time I mean, I'm just thinking about YouTube. <laughs> I think there's a lot of work that kind of explores that idea too. I mean, I think that you'll find 
I heard someone like a curator talking about this the other day, but there was this idea that the internet was kind of this utopic place. Um, but artists knew from the beginning that that wasn't true. Like if you look at like the early net artwork, a lot of that work like Jody or um, are very acutely aware of corporate intrusion on the web or um, even Mark Tribe's more modern work, um, you know, was really aware of uh, kind of how corporations are functioning on the web. There's a question in the chat. Uh, it would be the same in the art world to the extent that computers and the internet can be considered everything in our daily lives. I'm still completely tied to the traditional way or the historical way of fine art and obsessed with it. In fact, it's a really scary and difficult topic to talk about, but I want to ask you carefully, what do you think is the difference between fine art and computer art? I mean, my, my kind of reaction to that is to say that I don't really think that there is like a difference, right? Like, I don't know if... Um, you can kind of define art as being necessarily related to like a specific practice, right? Like I think especially conceptual art, like I like to think of my work as the, the art sits on top of the technology. The art isn't the technology. Um, the technology that's being used to kind of make it is, is just a tool that is probably going to go obsolete in like two years. Um, so the work isn't necessarily about the technology. It just kind of uses the technology and manifests that way. Um, so for me, but also keep in mind that I have kind of been in this world, you know, ever since like grad school. Um, so I don't necessarily like consider the things that I do as necessarily different from a fine art practice, like the places that I show, you know, are art galleries, art institutions. Um, so and I think um, kind of what the sort of like working from home a lot during the pandemic, what that kind of birth was this sort of newfound sort of interest in work that could be shown via remote technologies. Like I had a ton of shows just this last year with like big institutions that I probably would have never shown up before had there not been a demand um, to kind of show work that could be seen or experienced online. Hi, Mark. Besides NFTs, how has this kind of work collected? I'm wondering about the mixed reality piece that allowed you to grow palm trees. Would you make this available as an app or would it be more exclusive? I think that's an interesting question for me because I've always never had the kind of practice that like I necessarily thought that my work, like I never really placed a value on it because I didn't it was never part of my practice to kind of sell in a gallery that way. Like I would get funding from institutions or grants um, and who would end up kind of owning the work. But I did actually end up for charity uh, sort of doing this NFT. Let me find the link. But this was my first NFT. Uh, so this uh, company called Rally, that seemed pretty cool. Um, their coin, their token is based on Ethereum, uh, but they uh, are basically kind of like a community platform um, where anyone can kind of mint their own token, uh, release their own content, and have people uh, sort of buy their tokens and use their tokens. Um, so they commissioned me uh, to make a holiday NFT for them. I thought this whole thing was really funny. Um, but I like doing it. So this was my fun, this was my first NFT, um, and it was uh, kind of for a charity. All of the benefits uh, ended up benefiting um, this nonprofit organization called Life Play uh, that tries to encourage uh, creativity and technology in the arts. Um, so, forty editions of it were minted, um, and what people have when they buy this piece is they end up with this kind of motion graphic. Um, but if you kind of look on this website, like Rally itself, like there's a bunch of different kind of creators and they'll have, like I'll share my screen again for a minute. Like there's like all sorts of content. So an NFT can really be anything. Like it can be like a 3D, um, sort of graphic like this one. It can be like a picture. Uh, it can be an animation, et cetera. Like you can really mint anything nowadays. That's actually a little bit of what my piece 
um, what if we kissed by Dogecoin Peak is all about, like what does kind of valuable even mean in an era that you can kind of mint anything. Um, so back to the question, uh, the mixed reality piece specifically, Alibaba owns that. So um, like when I think about that piece, I think Alibaba will just own that piece. Um, and I don't know if it will ever kind of be something that we control. Um, but other than that, like I haven't been super interested as an artist in like engaging with NFTs more than I did. Like I never, I wouldn't have made this one had that platform not asked me to do that. Um, so it's just not something that personally within my practice, um, there are parts of it that I find. Uh, so like the really like benefit, beneficial parts that people talk about, like people like Lindsay Howard talk about is that um, it really um, makes the artist kind of directly in control of their work. So rather than giving like a cut to a gallery, you keep all of your own overhead. Um, so it makes the artist kind of more directly in control of how their work is distributed. And then you can also develop a community around your work. So people that like your work um, will collect your tokens and sort of buy it. And it kind of becomes for sale on your own terms. I think that there are a lot of things about NFTs that I'm personally not sure of, like the environmental impact um, within my practice that kind of inherently is sort of criticizing capitalism, especially hyper-capitalism in online spaces. Um, it's just not something that I've necessarily been interested in pursuing as an artist a bunch. Could you unpack that term hyper-capitalism for the, those of uh, us who don't know? Sure. I like uh, take that from this book that I'll link to. I read this book once, I think I was in grad school, called Hypermodernism uh, by this like French critical theorist named Jules Lipovetsky. And he basically characterizes like hypermodernism and hypercapitalism as an era that you don't know that you're being marketed to, as an era that you don't realize that what you're doing or the things that you're engaging in are capital. Um, so it's this very kind of insidious uh, sort of form of capitalism. While I'm asking about terms, yeah, I'm kind of obsessed with terms that we use as categories for art or, you know, to, to name or describe genres of art. And I noticed in your, in, in the bio you shared with us that I read that you self-identify as a new media artist. And I just found that interesting because that's a term that um, in some ways has gone you know, went in and then out of fashion. Um, and I'm wondering if, if you could speak a little bit about why you use that term as opposed to some of the other options. I thought, I, I, I did have different ones at some point. Like I would like call myself like a digital artist, et cetera. Uh, but I like the kind of broad net that new media sort of casts um, and that anything can kind of be described as new media. Like there was a time, you know, when I was, in school, especially that even things like video or interactivity were described as new media, and now that's no longer the case. So I like the open-endedness of sort of new media um, in that it uh, doesn't necessarily constrain you to a specific kind of technique. Like if I like said that I was, you know, like an internet artist, that's already kind of constraining myself to sort of web 2.0 or working with JavaScript or these kinds of other things, whereas new media is sort of more open than that. I also kind of find from like a curatorial perspective, like it, I think it's helpful to give people an entry into your work. Um, and for me, uh, using the term new media has been like a way to allow curators to kind of talk about my work. <laughs> Yeah, it's nice too because it links it to a broad, you know, a broader field of media art, which would include old media, like say film and video or things like that. Um, other questions from from students or comments? My question is, <clears throat> since you brought it up, uh, you brought up glitch feminism. Um, is it 
is it a noticeable like evolution of the conversation related to new media art where like now people are writing about it and ascribing terminology or a new vocabulary to it like is this threatening to the culture of digital arts or is this embraced by the culture I don't know if it's even necessarily like on a dichotomy like that. I found that, um, you know, what I really appreciate about kind of Legacy Russell's work, um, especially that Glitch Feminism book is I think that she um, is able to kind of write about things that a lot of people still have trouble describing. Um, and so a lot of that book are is, is really kind of like sophisticated thought around, um, that idea of being kind of network enabled. Um, so, I mean, I found that like, especially when I've worked with curators and this is like less and less the case, I feel like I've found like a kind of niche of people that are like familiar with like quote unquote new media work. Um, but um, I have found that sometimes it's a struggle, especially if you're working with kind of more emerging technologies um, to be able to have conversations in art spaces uh, because a lot of it is just explaining the, the technology or explaining the process. Um, and I think when I was in grad school, one of the things that I was really interested in was like specifically the technology itself. Like partly why I went to grad school was because I wanted uh, to kind of learn more about VR, learn about AR to, um, you know, write code that like hacked Wi-Fi systems. And as I've uh, kind of been out of school more, um, I think what has become more interesting to me is the conceptual art part of it. And I'm still working with the same things or working with evolutions of the same things, uh, but it's no longer kind of just sort of an obsession with the technology. Um, I, on that note, I kind of have a question regarding um, interacting with this technology and the actual art production. Um, do you have to utilize the technology uh, in order to uh, have commentary on it in a, in a way? I, I mean, so I, I uh, was in the show. I'll link you to it. Um, And I'll share my screen again. Uh, so I was in this show really recently um, and the piece that I showed was actually this like very old piece. So I was surprised that it kind of had shown a bunch. At this point, I have to kind of remake it. Uh, but it was this series of, uh, I called it localhost and it was this series of hacked Wi-Fi routers uh, that um, when, uh, so I like hacked these Wi-Fi routers using Pirate Box. Um, so basically when people connected to them, it streamed digital art to your phone. Um, and for this specific incarnation, uh, it was the show at the Cervantes Cultural Institute, which is like the UN Spanish Cultural Institute. So that curator had specifically sold me on the idea of showing uh, kind of work from different artists of the Spanish speaking diaspora. Um, and I bring this up because I ended up uh, working with this artist that I didn't know before named Barquito Garcia, uh, who uh, kind of makes all of this performative uh, social art after social media work about being like queer and Dominican. And one of the things that he said to me was like, he almost felt like being in control of the technology was sort of classist because there is an idea um, that kind of working with this technology is something that you're doing from like a really skilled, educated place. Um, and it's a barrier to a lot of people um, to be able to be in spaces where um, they're privy to that kind of education or that kind of knowledge. Um, but specifically in my work um, and kind of like my commitment to open source, um, you know, I think it's important to me that people not just sort of be users of technology, but that they um, kind of feel empowered by it. Uh, that's sort of one of the promises of Web 3.0 and the co-created web is that um, this kind of technology won't be centralized. It's not something that people are kind of like developing um, in offices somewhere, but it's something that um, kind of within all of our lives uh, we're working with. Um, I also think that kind of new media art as a whole has sort of opened up um, and you'll 
definitely see artists uh, who don't necessarily aren't interested in working with the technology on this level, that they're interested in kind of make, making work about it or making work that takes place on it. Um, you know, an example is like Amalia Ullman, um, who is not a programmer, but is like very well known uh, for digital pieces and performances through social media. Um, so I think that um, as this kind of work is shown more and more, and the relevance of it is something that curators are interested more in showing, um, it's not really super important uh, to kind of be crafting the technology in that sense. Uh, for me and my practice, it's, it's something that I'm interested in. It's like part of what I do is kind of hand make the work. Um, so, uh, yeah. Mark, can you, uh, I have a question. Hi, how are you? Great, thanks, how are you? Good, good. Um, a couple questions. Um, I think like Sang Ho, um, I, the lack of materiality in new media art is, it, it's, it's um, well, I don't need to repeat what he said. I guess my question to you is, what drives you to make this work? Do you wanna be an instigator? Do you wanna be a bad boy artist? It just fascinates you. Technology just fascinates you. What's the, again, what, what is driving you to create? Um, I definitely, I don't, I, I, I don't think of myself as like an instigator or as like a bad boy artist, but I think a lot of work that, that people are making kind of uh, that's informed by like hacktivism definitely has that idea of intervention. I don't see that in my work and it's not something that I'm kind of particularly attracted to. Um, mm -hmm. These were just things that I kind of was interested in working with. Like I wanted to learn how to program, so I did. And I wanted to um, kind of work um, with things like 3D printing and, and VR. Those are the things that, are, that, that I just sort of find interesting. Um, so a lot of it is just kind of like what I'm sort of personally interested in. Um, for me, you know, I almost like that there isn't like, I've been actually getting further and further away from even making anything physical. Like the next three shows that I'm in and the work that I'm showing are all kind of code-based uh, works on the web. Um, and that is, um, for me as an artist, uh, I think that there's a lot of interesting things for me there. Like one, um, I don't necessarily have to think of them kind of as like physical objects. Um, they are in many ways like representative of a process um, and there I can kind of change them. It's actually great being like a new media artist because you can like email the curate the gallery a link to the work and then keep updating it till it, till it opens pretty much. So I've like done that a bunch. Um, so I don't know if I'm necessarily motivated by being an instigator in as much um, as I find uh, kind of network culture super interesting. Um, and I find uh, the kind of techniques that I'm working with um, interesting. Uh, it's like personally gratifying to me uh, to be able to kind of figure out, um, you know, an algorithm that I was like stumped with for a long time or write a piece of code uh, that one could consider elegant and efficient. Um, those are things that, um, you know, are kind of just interesting to me on a personal level. That, that's great. That's, I, I got it now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and then my second question is what, I, I don't think it's, um, why, why, at least with many of the artists you've worked with, why is this? Why is there this intersection between sex and new media art? Is that that's? I'm assuming that's just coincidental in your work and the people the artists you're working with. It's not an overarching nugget within new media art. I'm gonna so. I'm going to link you to another article uh, because I think that that um, 
that kind of idea of sexuality in online spaces is like real, really well represented in that show. Um, but those artists specifically, I think we're interested in looking at how like sexuality is sort of like how you are allowed to kind of be sexual in online spaces. And I think, you know, part of all of that is really trying to figure out what space people can occupy online um, and what is allowed and what is not. And part of it is really kind of searching um, for new, more fulfilling ways to be online. Like right now, we're all kind of like meeting on Zoom and that's great. But I think for a lot of artists, especially people that kind of work much more physically, um, kind of being together online is seen as something of a compromise. Um, so I think a lot of artists uh, that are kind of specifically interested in like working with sex and sexuality um, in online spaces. Other than that one piece, I'm actually not. Uh, it was just kind of like that one piece that I did that was sort of like that. But um, I think part of it is like really related to uh, kind of trying to figure out more fulfilling ways to be online or to be virtual. Okay. Do you have any thoughts about it though? Because I know that you know uh, Chris. Yeah, a good friend of mine, yeah. Um, and that's all Chris's work is like, especially like queer gay male sexuality kind of yeah. expressed through. Um, I, I need to, I can't answer that immediately. <laughs> um, I hadn't really put all this together until you presented tonight. Um, so you've given me a bit to think about. Um, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if I really gave a satisfying answer either, because other than that one piece, um, you know, I, I don't know if I've necessarily like worked a lot with like the ideas of like sexuality in the web in ways like artists like Nahi, I'll give, I'll give you her website. Like all of her work is kind of like about like, especially like female sexuality on the web. Um, I guess Mark, um, are you like Frank Ocean? Do you travel with all your hard drives? <laughs> no, uh, that, is why I, that is why I'm actually like, uh, you know, really uh, kind of happy that I'm like making all of this web-based work because everything is just stored in the cloud. Like I literally need nothing except my laptop anymore. Like I no longer even have a studio. I just like my laptop is my studio and I just write code. Um, so, uh, I don't have a bunch of hard drives that I travel with, unfortunately. But it does mean that like Google is probably monitoring all of my online activities if they were interested in doing that, which they're probably not, but. Hey, uh, Mark, I, oh, sorry, I just, um, I had one more yeah. quick question. Sure. Yeah, so I, I was tinkering in there in the NFT space, like just, you know, seeing what's going on there. And I realized that like, like, um, and also cause I've been hearing people like Gary Vaynerchuk and all these like, all these like social media billionaires that are like, or millionaires that call each other up and say, hey, buy this NFT crypt, uh, crypto punk or board eight yacht club, whatever. But like they call each other, like millionaires call each other up, buy these things. And then essentially it seems like the whole NFT thing seems like a pyramid scheme where people on the bottom are paying into it and the people on the top are benefiting. And, but what I realized that is when you want to like a picture in one of these NFT marketplaces, you have to sign with your crypto wallet. And it just seems like it's going to end up being another form of control and another form of like everything you're doing per your wallet or per your address is all being controlled and monitored. And, and, you know, it, people like Gary Vaynerchuk, are promising this new, bright new future, but it just seems like it's another, you know, another hyper-controlled future. So I, so I think the uncertainty around NFTs is like definitely like this large conversation that happens uh, more and more. I recently uh, had to make a crypto wallet because Rally, that online platform, uh, they com their commission to me was in Ethereum. Uh, so I didn't have like a crypto wallet before. And then I ended up having, I had to ask my collaborator who's like really big in the NFT space. And then he like recommended uh, this platform called MetaMask, 
Um, so now this is the crypto wallet that I have uh, is on MetaMask. Um, but, and it's interesting to kind of hear your kind of perspective on it, because I think, you know, one of the kind of promises of NFTs and the blockchain is that it's supposed to be kind of almost opposite to that. Like right now, I think proponents of Web 3.0. Um, so I'll segue and talk a little bit about the blockchain for a minute, but I'm sure you're all somewhat familiar with this idea. Uh, but the blockchain is basically kind of like a distributed network. So right now, like our internet is kind of based on these like centralized networks that there are these centralized servers that companies like Amazon, Google, et cetera, own. And all of the data that runs the net um, is kind of located on those servers. So in essence, they have control over everything that happens on the internet. Um, but what kind of the blockchain and sort of by extension NFT economies, I think what the proponents of those things really sort of believe in is this idea that with the blockchain, that data is distributed to all of us that all of our computers kind of act as servers and they contain some of this data too. So in some ways, uh, the idea of an NFT and a blockchain comes from this very democratic space. But I'm also in this online show and one of the people showing is this artist collective, Jennifer and Kevin McCoy. Uh, but Kevin McCoy uh, says he created the first art NFT at a Rhizome event. Um, so I actually was on this panel where I kind of heard him talk about um, this. And there's this interesting Atlantic article that his collaborator kind of talks about. Um, so like, if you buy that Kevin McCoy created the first NFT, which he claims he did, I don't know, maybe Mark knows more about that because it was like through Rhizome, but. That's what they say. I mean, it was at a seven on seven event. And uh, he and Anil Dash kind of, as I recall, like Anil Dash was the technologist and he was the artist and they had 24 hours and came back and presented the first, yeah, the first art NFT. But, but I mean, have, have you heard anybody contradict that? Because maybe- So they were, from what I know, is that they were supposedly created to like protect artists. So when Kevin McCoy talks about NFTs and the original kind of motivation for making them is that he wanted uh, to create a way that people couldn't kind of take things that he was posting online. So like they would post images of their work, you know, to the social media at that time, someone could just kind of like take it because that's the nature of the web. Um, and so his idea was to kind of like mint uh, these sort of digital manifestations of work, give them all kind of a unique idea. And that's sort of the basis of the NFT is that anything that you mint as an NFT has kind of like a unique singular sort of code associated with it. Like now in like my crypto wallet, if I wanna like get paid in crypto, I like give people that like six, that like really long crypto code. And that's like the only way that they have to like transact uh, through the blockchain. So the original idea of the NFT was actually to protect artists, but I think a lot yeah, of and one other piece of it was so artists could earn royalties and basically control resale. Yeah. Right? So like after yeah. the after the first sale, like you know, artists could say, well, I you know, I get a, I get a a percentage of royalty on every resale, that kind of thing. I have to say though, like the first NFT I made, I was actually super uncomfortable with this idea of additioning. Like I think for me, kind of one of the reasons I'm attracted to like working on the web. Um, is because it sort of resists the idea of there being kind of like a singular unique piece. Like I like the idea that there were like many iterations of my work and that it could show differently at different times. Um, and then it wasn't linked to a singular iteration. Um, so that was one of the things conceptually that I had like problems with when Rally asked me to make an NFT was this idea of additioning. And it was like freaking me out that people kept buying it. Um, and, but I think in the end though, my relationship with NFTs is a little bit like I, I had kind of done it for this nonprofit cause. So it ended up, I think that there, you know, there are a lot of 
other issues that I may have had with it that I didn't end up having because it was kind of through this nonprofit exercise. Is that the same thing as like anonymity in a way? Like, are you trying to like escape the idea of authorship in, in the idea of like avoiding additioning and allowing the kind of free web to manipulate the, the original product or the original piece? It just like freaked me out that like 400 people were like owning some like singular quote unquote edition of this like motion graphic that I made. I, just because I like within my practice, I like had always kind of seen the web as kind of this like living space. Um, I think the very nature of kind of showing online is like the technologies that kind of encompass the web are always changing. Um, so like, you know, right now we're using HTML5, CSS4, uh, iteration of JavaScript called ES16, um, which wasn't the case like three years ago. Uh, so to kind of like show work in that sort of landscape is you're constantly kind of updating and changing your work. Um, so it like really bothered me to kind of think of the addition as kind of like freezing this moment or like encapsulating this yeah. moment, um, which wasn't a way that I was like accustomed to thinking about things. Can I chime um, in on this? Oh. Yeah. Who is who wanted to add? I, I'd rather have a student. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I had like a I had a question earlier and then it felt like maybe it was irrelevant, but then it feels relevant again. That do you struggle then with feeling like a piece is ever finished? If if like it seems like it's really important to you that your work is hinging on this like always evolving, always editable like space. So maybe maybe like it being finished isn't even important, but like how do you resolve that tension? Because even like I, I don't make new media art and I have a problem like finishing my own pieces. So I can only imagine what it's like when you know you could just go back into the code and like, you know, change something. I mean, for me, maybe it's because I'm a Gemini. I'm not, I'm an Aries. But like, uh, I think for me, like uh, there's something that, you know, if, if, if can you think of like a website ever being finished? Like if you look at like SVA's website, it's a different website than what it was two years ago. And part of that is because of necessity um, just to adapt. Uh, to the technologies that it's being presented on. And part of that is like changing ideas of relevance or however they're trying to promote themselves at a given time. Um, and so I personally really kind of identify with the ability um, to make work that's like that. Like I make websites. Um, so they're never to kind of make a website that's sort of frozen um, means that no one's gonna be able to see it five years from now. Uh, because the web will probably have changed so significantly that you won't be able to even show that work anymore. Except for the Space Jam website, you can still visit that. <laughs> and there's a site, um, I'll share this other project. Um, there's like this site that's sort of dedicated to archiving uh, this old geo caching these old GeoCities websites. Um, so I kind of think that like, I mean, and you know, this is obviously a complete exact over exaggeration, but like I almost think that like kind of being like I'm gonna make this this piece and it's gonna be done is gonna to lead to a website like on Cameron's world that just like looks super dated and is very like connected and you can kind of see the evidence of when it was sort of made. Um, and so part of like kind of why I'm interested in making the work that I make is because there's an idea of it being finished for that context, like whether that's like an exhibition or like a show um, there's an idea of it being finished for that time, but it could change later. Like, I don't want my work to be like, oh, this should be on MySpace, right? Like, I want to be on the next, the next thing. Um, I want to try to tie together just a couple of thoughts here and put them in historical perspective, if that's okay. So, I mean, this, Sangho and James both brought up the question of 
um, the kinds of new media art that that you've been making, Mark, and that you know the other artists that you've been showing with make um, strikes certain people as somehow other than or outside of what they think of art. There's a sort of it it, and I've just noticed this. This has happened for a long time, like at least 25 years, that. Um, certain kinds of art provoke a kind of um, policing of the boundaries by insiders. And it happens also sometimes with other kinds of boundary pushing activities, but it happens a lot with stuff that involves technology. It seems to provoke a kind of defense response. Um, and I just noticed there's a parallel between that and the challenge that art markets have dealing with any kind of art that is immaterial, ephemeral, transitory, performative, because you know the art market is set up to value things that are stable, especially stable artifacts, you know, things that you can put in physical storage, take out, dust off, turn on the lights, and they, they work, right? Um, not things that are changing all the time, inherently unfinished, um, that happen and then don't happen anymore. Um, so it's interesting to think, everybody about how we are all to some extent like hosts that have been infected by a contagious virus of what we might, for lack of a better word, call, call capitalism, or at least market thinking, right? The logic of the marketplace is something that we have internalized in there and then reproduced somehow because we recognize perhaps that it's in our own interest to do so. Because our ability to recognize what's validated by the market and what's not is one of the things that gives us fitness in the kind of competitive marketplace, survival fitness. So there's this kind of also sort of weird economic Darwinism taking place, I think, where people want to say, okay, we're in this in-group, right? And we know because we know the, the language of, of the market and we're going to police the boundaries of this group. And one of the ways in which you establish you're in this is by um, marginalizing the other. And I just noticed that happening a little bit, even tonight. Um, so it's just interesting to sort of be a little bit internally critical um, of why that happens and, and um, what's the sort of the, the, the invisible logic, i.e. the ideology of that. I mean, I will say that like for me personally, I wasn't ever like an artist that kind of like started off with a background in like fine art, painting and drawing and, and kind of the more um, traditional sort of methodologies for art. But I have worked with a lot of people like Ava, who I just showed with, started off as a painter before kind of um, sort of decide. I mean, she described it to me one day as just deciding that she didn't want to paint anymore. Um, so she started making more like new media work. Um, my collaborator, Ziyong, you know, went to RISD, has like a, studied like painting in Italy in like one of those schools that was like devoted to the old masters before uh, kind of making the work that he's making now. Um, so there are, I think that there are artists that are able to kind of move through that, but I do hear, I don't know, like sometimes I get the impression that people to just kind of like put it in a very frank manner, maybe don't necessarily see the act of writing code as necessarily as pure as like painting or drawing or something. Um, that's not something that, but for me, it was never an option just because I didn't ever have that kind of practice. There's something about, you know, some of some things that we don't have a problem with, like say poetry, um, which is totally non, is not physical, it's ephemeral. Um, and, and can also, especially when it's, um, talk poetry, you know, or slam poetry, you know, is something that happens. Um, Mark, do you have, you know, any any closing um, thoughts or um, comments as you, you know, because you know this department and our curriculum and our students really, uh, you know, like the back of your hand. And, um, you know, I'm wondering if, if you want to, um, yeah, just leave us with any thoughts about, you know, how we might want to think about, um, integrate um, what, what you choose to call new media art uh, in, the, in the program? Um, I think that, I mean, I don't think that there's, 
you know, in a lot of ways, I think that people should be able to pursue the practices that they want to, especially in like an environment like grad school. So um, I don't think that there should, people should any feel any, you know, kind of anything other than, you know, kind of inspiration when maybe like confronted uh, or presented with work um, that is like quote unquote new media. Uh, but I do think, um, you know, that sort of socially, uh, we're kind of moving to an era where ideas of like being virtual or being ephemeral or being online, like Legacy Russell talks about this a lot in that Glitch Feminism book, um, are basically collapsing. So there's like no kind of difference between like a virtual object or the differences between a virtual object and like a physical object, the ontology of them is really um, kind of changing. Um, I also think people are, are, are very interested in kind of showing work um, that is a reflection on some ways of being internet or technologically aware. Um, and so I think, I don't know, maybe this is, maybe this is gonna be too broad of a statement. Maybe people will give me thumbs down for this, but I think it like behooves a grad program to kind of introduce this conversation. I think that a grad program would be doing artists a disservice um, if they didn't necessarily uh, kind of talk about uh, these ideas that are very kind of present in uh, conversations about contemporary art. Trying to, um, it's interesting how like among our students and faculty, there are some who are really interested, um, you know, and others who aren't. And I think that's, for me, that's part of what, you know, as, as I was like new media, all new media art all the time for the better part of, 10, 15 years. And now I love sort of being in this more, this environment where people are doing things that other people are, are unfamiliar with and even skeptical about um, and vice, you know, and vice versa. That kind of, to me, that diversity and skepticism can create really healthy conversations. Um, Suzanne, I see your hand is up. Did you want to um, chime in on this? You're still muted though. Okay. Um... One thing I was going to ask earlier was because you're using the words art and fine art in different way and, and indiscriminately, and that perhaps there's something about a traditional notion of fine art, but because Mark, Mark Ramos, obviously what you're doing is, is all art. Um, the other thing, I, but I thought in terms of changing the, the department is that you encourage more people who are involved in media art to apply to the department and you create a situation in the department that's clearly a place where th that work, um, new media art thrives. Right? Not so sure, but it's worth, worth, worth further discussion. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, to, well, to respond, I mean, a couple of things. One is, you know, we also have, we're in a school that has a computer art program and also a photo video related media program. So those tend to siphon off, you know, students, we do inevitably get some artists who really want to work with technology or photography or video related media, but want to be in a more post-disciplinary environment. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, we sort of don't ever do anything once students are here to create microclimates. You know, we don't have like a painter section and a printmaker section and a photographer section and a new media artist section. It's like everybody is just sort of in the mix. Mm -hmm. um, um, but yeah, you know, it's, it is interesting to see how, um, I mean, the conversations at Rhizome about how interest in new media art has, or digital art has just been exploding in recent years and the market for it too has finally really taken off. It's still, you know, uh, <laughs> far, 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 far behind painting. Um, but, um, but this whole NFT thing, I mean, I think it's perceived to be such a threat because suddenly there's this other market space where, you know, works of new media art or dig and digital objects of different kinds are selling for, I mean, you know, 99% of them are selling for next to nothing, but then there's this, you know, a few of them that are going for, for, for bonkers numbers. Um, right. Any other, you know, last thoughts? Oh, for, I know a lot of you are interested in, in art markets. Um, and for those of you who are interested in taking um, William Bill Pauhida's uh, course, it, you know, it's interesting. It shows up in 
uh, my services as Art Market. The, just note, the full title is Art Market and the Aesthetics of Wealth. And if you read the description, that course is going to be coming from a kind of a very skeptical, almost anti-market perspective. So if you expect to take that course to learn how to sell your work, maybe you will, but it'll also give you a healthy dose of critical perspective on the logic of markets, the way that they reproduce um, you know, uh, economic inequality, um, exploitation, uh, uh, alienated labor, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't mean to, um, to take, uh, you know, to, to um, what's it? How? To, to spoil, you know, I don't want to, it's like spoiler alert, but, but that, that course may not be quite what you expect. I think hopefully in a very good way, in a very eye-opening way. Um, just still calling for more last words, last questions, last comments. Well, uh, I'm very interested in all of your work. So please um, don't hesitate to sign up for a studio visit with me, even if you think that we make work that's very dissimilar because I'm mm. uh, very interested in um, kind of, you know, I think painting and code can have a conversation and I've definitely been in shows where that has happened. So, um, you know, I'm interested in the work that you are all making too. Thanks for listening to me though. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for sharing your work. Um, nice that you're able to give a talk and um, do studio visits and teach a seminar um, this semester. Um, so really appreciate it and uh, good night, everyone. <laughs>